Welcome to Comics on the Pyre, where everyone can come and indulge in all things comic related, whether it be movies, TV shows, cartoons, video games, or just comics themselves. If you love comic books, then show it by hitting that subscribe button to help this precious media that we all love thrive and flourish. Entering the Exosphere Moon World of Reef, a lone spaceship touches down on an isolated landing strip on the pinnacle mountain top. In the silence of the night, the only sound that could be heard is the hydraulics releasing its pressure to open the hatch door. Disembarking from the craft is one lone man and its feline companion. The taste of the cold, sharp mountain air, as well as a freshly rolled tobacco, fills his lungs, and then he exhales back into the night, and it is wasted away. Upon entering one of the cavern tops, the Cape Visitor announces his presence, and is answered by a vigilant watchdog. A soft-spoken salutation is greeted with an infernal response. The stranger reflectively shields himself and his companion with a flame-retardant cloth, giving him a momentary respite to plan his next move. Waiting for the incendiary demon's next blaze, the man knows instinctively that both his aim and his timing must be true, or his body will be scorched and his ashes spread across the mountaintop. Just as the horn beast crouches to release the torrent of flames, the visitor hurls a combustible package into the maws of the infernal, causing an explosion that echoes down that cave and blows off the beast's head clean off, leaving the man to stand in a deluge splatter of flesh and blood. Just then, an older female appears descending a nearby stairwell. She congratulates the bounty hunter on passing her audition. But the will is nobody's stooge. But he quickly finds out that neither is she. Baze is a unicorn horned woman who is closely affiliated with the Reef High Command. The Reef being the moonlight planet that the two now both stand upon. The woman despises freelancers. But our quarry, who goes by the name of Marco, shares the same appalling sense of moral relativism as the will. And besides, if he is not captured soon, the tablets of prophecy have just revealed that Marco will soon be responsible for the deaths of millions of innocent souls. Lying, hisses the spink like cat with pale blue green skin and yellow eyes. The outburst takes Vez back. Caught in her deception, the ever-diplomatic woman confesses to the details of her true intentions. On the planet Cleve, a foot soldier named Marco chose to renounce his oath and betray the narrative by, um, let's just say fraternizing with enemy combatant to protect troop morale. My superiors want both Marco and his whore eliminated by a discreet subcontractor before the word of their coppling spreads to the rank and file. And to make sure that the will is not dilatory in his duty, she has hired other bounty hunters who will reap the rewards if his skills prove mm, unsatisfactorily wanting. Looking to the will's feline companion, she states, am I lying now? The cat's mute response only verifies her statement. Oh, and one last thing before Vaz departs. The bounty's presence, she informs him that the Mooney known as Marco has succeeded in siring an offspring with the landfallian known as Elena. The will interrupts and offers to kill the little runt. Absolutely not, Vez responsibly replies. If the will wishes to collect on the bounty, he is to execute the parents but bring back the infant alive and unharmed. Before the man can respond, Vez stampers off barefooted, leaving a spore of the incendiary demon's blood in her wake. Perplexed by this last caveat of the contract, he looks at the lion cat and states, what kind of asshole brings a kid 
into worlds like these. Welcome to another episode of Comics on the Pyre, my friends. In this episode, I will be going over Ryan K. Bond's Saga, Volume 1, which collects the first six issues of an ongoing series. Saga? Mm, it's kind of a hard comic to describe. It's one of those stories that needs to be experienced rather than told about. If I tried to explain it to someone, they probably would just respond by just saying, that sounds stupid. But trust me, it works when you read it, and for so many reasons. First of all, and I say this with the most vanilla of intentions, the comic, it's unconventional. I mean, how many comics do you know start out with a birthing scene? And as the child is being born, the couple spat over their own sexual proclivities. See what I mean? The world Vaughn builds is also outlandish. You have humans with monsters for heads, spider women assassins, disemboweled specters that inhabit a haunted forest, and a rocket ship that is actually a living tree that can travel from space. All these science fiction and fantasy elements are dropped into a story with real world consequences and the results that readers can relate to. You have two races that live in two totally different planets. One is called Landfall, the largest planet in the galaxy, and the other, Reef, a satellite moon that orbits Landfall. The two races have been fighting for so long, no one even remembers the origin of their conflict. The one thing that they do know is that total obliteration of one planet will set the other planet off orbit and therefore go spinning into space, thereby just as likely destroying themselves as well. You would think that this suggestive metaphor would bring reason to this conflict, but oh no. Instead of finding peace between the two races, they outsource their quarrel to other planets, infecting them with their own squabbles, forcing them to pick a side, which means by doing so that they now make two worlds that were at peace, or who maybe didn't even know the other planet existed at war with each other. The high school mean girl's equivalent of, if she doesn't like you, then no one will. Jeez, I like to see how we evolved as a species. I really think the main reason why this bizarre and strange world works so well is because of Brian K. Vaughn's strong, masterful writing ability of characterization. Each line of dialogue seems authentic, like it would be spoken by a friend a stranger on the street. Each character is introduced into the story with their own personal problems and background that they are trying to deal with, making them feel more authentic and lifelike. At times, you'll be rallying for the bad guys, and at others, you'll wish the hero would just shut up and grow a pair. And this is a good thing for a story to do because it draws you in and makes you feel involved. Well, that's all I want to say about this for now. And so, I give this first volume a 4.0 out of 5. A great read ranking. And can easily see myself giving this series a higher score and volumes to come. If you get a chance, please visit my YouTube channel, Comics on the Pyre, for other videos like this one. Comment below other comic story arcs you feel deserve some limelight. Tap on the bell icon before you go. And oh yes, as always, until next time, keep reading my friends.